Well, in this, this particular part, this part of the passage that we're looking at today, uh, we did verses 12 and 13 last week, and we're 14 through to 18 this week. Paul is he's addressing one of the main hindrances uh, to his teaching around spiritual growth. We took in spiritual growth last week, and, and, and one of the main hindrances in living a life that's worthy of the gospel, Paul's already explained that to us, and that is grumbling. And then he gives us a practical bit of advice uh, that leads us to a more attractive alternative than grumbling, and that's, and that's gladness and gratitude, uh, an anthem of praise. An anthem of praise must always replace the sound note of grumbling in the people of God. Paul gets into this, he addresses one of the most underestimated but over-engaged uh, pastimes of the Christian church. Grumbling and disputing. We're well known for it through the centuries. And for Paul, this is the number one obstacle on the pathway to spiritual growth. And it is the number one obstacle to the message of the gospel, being able to have credibility, being able to, 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 to get out and impact the lives of people that have been watching this Christian community. It's the number one thing that stops it from distinguishing itself as a legitimate claim that leads to the fullness of life, the joy uh, that it says is attached to it. Uh, we've talked about how it turns uh, adversity into adventure, how it, uh, it, it allows us to respond with humility in environments of hostility, to maintain hope when, when hardship is, is heavy in our lives, to be joyous when it's impossible to be happy. Gladness and rejoicing over grumbling and disputing. Grumbling is a, a time-honored, universal, uh, self-prescribed therapy through which we seek comfort and we seek consensus. It's a way of forming bonds through shared experience. It's so natural to most of us that we start just about every conversation with grumbling. How was your trip to church today? Crazy, lucky to be here. And the Pan Highway was like a car park. Those stinking cyclists out there trying to save the planet, same time getting fit. Where do they get off riding in their designated bike lanes? And on top of that, I got every single red light, which made me even later than when I left. Had to park over there in a four hour car park, walk 80 meters to get it to the door. But despite all that, I'm here. Yes, I am, grumble. Grumble, grumble. That's cool. But how was church? But how was church? How was church? Once you got here, how was church? Oh, great. Yeah, church was great. But you know, I don't really like the type of music they play at my church. More of a hill song or maybe a hymn, depending on what side of the fence you sit on. Type. That's how I like to worship. Not that I've been asked to join the team. Oh, and our pastor, God bless him, he just goes on and on. Why are you laughing? And on, <laughs> or, or maybe you've got a pastor like this. He's finished before you can even try to finish checking your socials. You know, you got into church. Oh, I wonder what's happening there. What he's done, more depth, more content to his preaching than low-fat milk. The kids, ah, kids in church, so noisy. Hard for me to complain. I mean, concentrate on things. And then the coffee. Oh my, the coffee. I think they brewed it in some of that water that runs out from the overflow sewage pipe thing into the bay. And I caught up with Doug. You know Doug. He's never got anything good to say. Yeah, but I keep coming. You know, grumble, grumble, grumble. Or murmur, murmur, murmur. Or maybe you've heard this one. How you traveling, brother? Tired, long week. So many interruptions. I mean opportunities, so many meetings, so many ministry demands, hardly had space to write my sermon. But you know, I'm here, grumble, 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 just so you're not alone. We can all grumble, right? Yeah? And it kind of feels good, doesn't it? To share how hard we have things and how hard it is to live with other people. What's Paul's problem? Why is he so hardcore about something so natural to the human condition? Why such strong and such absolute language 
at the beginning of this passage. Why does Paul say do all things without grumbling and disputing? Well, two reasons. There could be more, but two that I can think of. Firstly, grumbling, and this is one of those cool words, like in the Greek, it's gogosmos. It actually sounds like what you're doing. Gogosmos, gogosmos, gogosmos. Grumble, grumble, grumble. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. It's the relentless whispering and spreading and sharing of displeasure at circumstances, at conditions, at, at company. It has a complete opposite effect to working out, to the working out of your salvation, the, the thinking of others more highly than yourselves, the humility, the hope, and, and the peace and the joy that the gospel has claimed to bring into the lives of this community, into the lives of this people that it's making. And it's also, this is also true of the corresponding word that Paul uses there, disputes, grumbling and disputes, a word that uh, describes the practice of petty dialogue that calls everything into question, just this argumentative spirit that has a resting sense of annoyance at absolutely everything. And Paul says, do nothing out of a heart that nurtures this kind of relational acid and, and hostility because it does nothing to build unity. It actually tears apart uh, what the gospel, the, the word of life, Paul calls it, has brought together. That's the first thing it does. And then the second thing it does is it obscures, it disfigures the witness and the purpose of this new community in a crooked and twisted generation. When we grumble, when we nurture uh, petty dialogue, we, we don't distinguish ourselves from the culture around us. And we don't say that having a relationship with Jesus makes us any better. When we grumble, when we have these petty disputes, it, it actually reveals that nothing's changed. This, this knowing Jesus doesn't really do any practical good to relationships. Conduct worthy of the gospel is conduct that promotes the goodness of the gospel to get in and actually do something inside of relationships participating in grumbling is a destructive assault on the spiritual growth that Paul talks about in verses 11 and 12 and it pours acid on the very fabric of unity that holds this community together of people who have experienced uh, the redeeming love of God. All these things that Paul has been talking about, your saints, the peace of God, the hope of God, all these realities, the mind of Christ, all this stuff at work in you being eroded away by the presence of grumbling. And Paul's language here would not be lost on his initial listeners. It immediately calls to mind the grumbling and the murmuring of the Israelites in the wilderness. We read about that in Exodus. Just like a hot minute after uh, being freed from slavery, they are grumbling, murmuring, grumbling about where God has led them, grumbling about who is leading them, questioning the goodness of God, questioning the capacity of Moses, even suggesting that God's work in their lives and the people that he has supplied them are worse than the Pharaoh's oppression or worse than being in, under the abuse and the slavery back in Egypt. And in Deuteronomy uh, 32.5, it's this grumbling and complaining that sees Moses describes them, the people of God, as a crooked and twisted generation. A description that Paul alludes to as a warning of something to avoid. A warning that he makes explicit in 1 Corinthians 10. Don't be characterized by this kind of heart, this kind of attitude. It leads to death. It's a powerful reminder of, the, of, a, of, of what a disobedient life leads to. Not one worthy of the gospel. It leads to death. It leads to things being torn apart and pulled apart. For Paul, grumbling is not a healthy therapeutic outlet. It actually reveals a spirit of ingratitude against God about where he has led you where he, and who he has placed around you, who he has you partnering and participating in this community, in this gospel life with. Questioning his goodness, questioning the purpose 
by grumbling against the environments he has led you to, and never ever once drawing a breath in gratitude for the environments that he saved you from. Grumbling diminishes, it dismisses the goodness of God who works and wills in our lives for our, our spiritual growth. In grumbling, we are positioning our sailboat that we spoke about last week to be smashed to pieces on the rocks. Grumbling is a, is a dehumanizing practice that deforms our hearts and our identities until there's nothing left but bitterness and a critical mood crowding out every other part of our personality. A personality that Paul has said all the way through this letter is shaped and animated by the mind of Christ uh, who himself did not grasp at uh, his own rights, did not grumble once about having to come to planet earth and endure you and I and, and, and do the work and save us. In fact, it's talking about for joy. For joy he endured the cross. Why? What's so joyful about that? It's the same kind of joy that Paul talks about later in his letter. It's the joy of, 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 of knowing that, that out of this is going to become... Uh, people who are saved, who are redeemed, who are in this relationship with God. It's that kind of joy. Went on a tangent, lost where I was. Christ never grumbled about his rights. Now grumbling is different uh, to lament. Lament is the act of crying out to God, not, not, not murmuring to peers and people. Lament is the responding to injustice and suffering, not styles and tastes and behaviors. And the Psalms are full of lament because in lament we go to God. We don't go to other people to seek you know, mutual consensus. We go to God in honest expression of our sorrow. Lament finds counsel and comfort in God's character and promises, whereas grumbling uh, takes comfort in our words and our whinings being heard by others. And nor is Paul saying that we can never question or have discussions about different ideas. Paul has already framed up for us the nature of our disagreements and differences. They had to be done in humility, in, in thinking of others more significant than yourselves. Grumbling is the opposite of humility. It's, 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 it's kind of almost a passive-aggressive play for power. It's a, a victimized way of saying that you, the grumbler, are more important than others. It's a significant sin against relationships. So Paul says, have nothing to do with this approach to life. He says, we are to do all things without grumbling and disputing. And the scope of this all things is universal. For Paul, the Christian life is on public display 24-7. And so grumbling should not flavor our public or our private relationships whether that's here, whether that's at home, in our marriages, our work, school, church, uh, recreation, parenting, friends, you, you name it. The Christian life should not be characterized by grumbling. There's nothing that's not included in this phrase of Paul's. Because Paul's concern is that when Christians grumble, when they participate in petty discussions with this critical kind of ungracious spirit, a watching world can rightly point its finger and say, your gospel has not brought you any more peace, any more joy than the average punter, the average pagan already has in their lives. Your relationships and, and, and how they operate are just as fractious, are just as fragile, are just as dysfunctional as ours. When we grumble when we are more known for what frustrates us rather than what frees us, we obscure and we, we actually falsely testify to the, to the goodness of the gospel in our lives. We, we actually paint a false picture of, of the realities that exist, of what's meant to be. And Paul says that shouldn't be. You're to be rather, the, the contrast is to be blameless and, and innocent children of God without blemish. Now, 
this little line here that Paul's using is not to be perfect. But again, Paul is, is uh, referencing back to a description of the people of Israel as they went through the desert. And he's sort of saying, do not make the same mistakes as your ancestors made. Israel failed to give up their discord. Israel failed to give up their disputing and, 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 and their grumbling. They failed to exchange all of that for gladness and gratitude of, of having God in their midst. Regardless of the environments, regardless of the circumstances, they had God with them. And in doing so, they failed to present uh, a unified witness of, of the goodness of God in a community and how that brings that community together rather than tears it apart and pushes it into different corners. And, and the whole purpose of that was that they were supposed to be a light to the nations in a dark world around them. Likewise for us. The blamelessness and the blemishness lessness is that a word is not about their performance or their abilities but about their their attitudes about their dependency on God to do in them what he promised to do this is a call for faithfulness of heart in the goodness and the greatness of God that results in a life of joy even in hard environments even when it's impossible to be happy and this faithfulness is is what we might call, like thinking back to last week, this faithfulness, this, this, this work in us, is what we might call the preparation of our sailboat. The actual active uh, re resisting of grumbling, and as we'll see, the, the gratefulness and gratitude for who God is in our lives. To be blameless children of God is to have a devoted approach to life that should distinguish them, should distinguish us in an undeniably positive light. Because their lives and our lives shine forth the joy and the flourishing that is found in obedience against, in a contrast, against a crooked and twisted generation. There should be something compelling about how we live, something that is undeniably good and attractive. As we said last week, the people should say, as Jesus said they would say in John 13, see how this group of natural born enemies kind of love each other, see how they move toward each other, it should be, it should be an attractive distinction, even if it is um, confronting the cultural drift, even if people go, ah, oh, those Christians. And maybe Paul, in this analogy of shining like lights, I think we talked about this on Monday night, is this... The thinking about the role that the stars played in creation and that the stars and the luminaries uh, play in, in, the, um, in the ancient world of, of guiding and directing people, their constant, uh, steadfast, faithful uh, positions that guide people consistently and accurately to get where they need to go, to understand the seasons and all these things. Our lives should be like that, should be luminaries in the sky that guide people accurately and truthfully to the goodness of God. But perhaps, no doubt, the best commentary on Paul's words here and probably the motivation for them come from Jesus himself in Matthew's Gospel in Matthew 5, 14 to 16. Jesus describes his disciples as people who, who, uh, who already are the light of the world and that they are to act in ways that let their light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Our conduct, our relationships, our speech, uh, in this case our refusal to uh, take part uh, in any way in relating to each other, in relating to the world around us via grumbling and complaining, should have an attractional edge to it that leaves people with an undeniable evidence of the goodness of God at work in our lives. And this is what Paul says, this is what it is to hold fast. He says you're to hold fast to the word of life. This is what it is. It's a, it's a phrase that Paul uses to describe a life lived uh, worthy of the gospel. To hold fast also carries this idea of not just 
clinging on to something, but, but holding something out, presenting something. Uh, it's a picture of your actions matching the message because the message of the gospel is shaping your actions. You're holding on to it. You're holding it out. The gospel should be held onto in their hearts and it should be held forward in their words and deeds. And those words should not be grumbling in such a way that while people might not agree with the message, they cannot deny the effects of the message and the lives of its carriers and its conveyors. Now, Paul's next comment might seem a little self indulgent, particularly against Jesus' objective of our lives being lived to shine, not our glory, uh, not for our pride, but for the glory of God. But this is a little window into the pastoral heart of Paul, the heart of, actual, of, of Christ actually dwelling in him. Nothing could warm his heart more than people that he has partnered with, that he has participated with in the gospel, standing with him in unity when Jesus returns. This would be the ultimate validation of Paul's ministry and it would be the ultimate uh, validation of the goodness of God to, to faithfully endure in the lives of his people. It is the basis of joy, his pride, or better, this word is better, probably better rendered, his, his rejoicing, his personal expression. And it's due to seeing the Philippians He's picturing them on the day that Jesus returns, that they are standing complete in the working out of their salvation. They have quit their grumbling. They have uh, held on to and held out the gospel. And Paul rejoices over what the Lord has done in them and that Paul was able to be used uh, in those purposes, even if it meant being imprisoned and beaten and put in prison again. Seeing people go on and complete their faith completes the joy that already exists in Paul, his own personal relationship with Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've ever invested into the lives of people, in sown the gospel into the lives of people, nurtured faith, been involved in discipleship, Andy... It just and, and then, you know, you go off on your different roads and you do whatever, and then you touch base with them, like 10, 15, depending on how old you are, 20, 30 years, and they're still walking with the Lord. In fact, their faith, their spiritual growth is good. It, there's a sense of joy, is there not? I, you know, well, I think back to some of the kids we had in youth and you connect with them and, and they're, they're serving in their churches and you think, man, and it's not, it's not pride, it's rejoicing in the goodness of God. That's, this, that's what Paul's talking about here. It's not selfish, it's praise. It's actually delighting in the goodness of God. And this is what Paul is hoping for. And this is what Paul is hoping that not just he would experience, but they would experience. Paul finishes this section with more allusion to Old Testament. This time the practice of offerings and sacrifices in his life is poured out on top of the sacrifice of their lives. And Paul describes the mutual cost of partnering and participating in a life of obedience to the gospel, a life of pursuing uh, holiness over hostility, this life of, of, of seeing adventure in adversity, of hope in hardship and dependency on the goodness of God. It's not something to grumble about but something to express as a shared story of gratitude and gladness. And here's the antidote at the end of this passage. There's four separate um, comments about joy and, and gratitude. The antidote towards grumbling is praise. When you gather, when you come in, gather around stories of praise. This is what should color your conversations, the goodness of God, God's capacity to will and work in your life to save you, to every time you catch a red light. That's just an opportunity to pray for the poor bike rider on the side of the road. The goodness of God, God's capacity to work and will in your life to save you. And not just to save you as a historic event, but in every environment, in every difficult relationship, 
every lycra wearing obstacle on the Nepean highway. God is at work in your life, developing your spiritual growth through these things and your dependency on him. These, these are the stories that should be murmuring from our mouths. Paul is saying, take joy in these stories. Take Take joy in your shared story. Shared stories of faith in Christ. Take joy in the story that you see taking place in each other. Joy in the story that you see taking place in me. Joy in the story that you see taking place in your brothers and sisters. Adversity transformed into adventure, hostility into an opportunity to respond with humility, the crookedness and the twistedness of our lives transformed into a pursuit of holiness, selfless, selfishness into looking out for the interests of others and all of this shining like lights that guide a lost and weary people to a message of hope. In the hardness of a sin-overwhelmed world, where the only thing to do is grumble, to ease the pain. My sister-in-law has a stage three, stage four cancer in her brain. It's been there for 18 years and statistically she, sh she probably shouldn't be here, but she is. And we're going to be celebrating her 50th birthday in May. Incredible medical and surgical intervention has allowed her to keep living, has given her life. But I would strongly push across the table that prayer and approach to life that is devoid of grumbling and petty dialogue and ingratitude a life of joyful dependency of God, of celebrating the story in her life, has kept her around. Her life for the past 18 years has been one that is of constant frustration, constant limitations, loss of ability, but you wouldn't know it. She rejoices in the life that has been given to her. She smiles constantly. It's irritating. She lives her life out of gratitude for what she has been given, not for what she has had taken away from her. And the story of God in her life shines like stars in darkest night. As an environment and circumstances that should lead to grumbling, surrenders to praise. That's because it's, it's, it's not magical. It's because she has positioned herself like the sailboat we talked about last week to know God, to have him in her life. This is not fairy tale stuff. This is deep heart relationship. And I am sure at her birthday, her story, will not be about her cancer. Her story will be about Christ. Who saved her from the penalty of sin, who continues to save her from the power and the practice of sin, and will one day save her from the presence of sin, in particular cancer. Our gathering should not be a gathering of grumbling, but a gathering of gratitude, of grateful rejoicing in what we have encountered in Christ, sharing that story with each other against and in contrast to a bent out of shape and crooked generation. Let's pray. I find this morning so confronting. My heart is prone to grumble. 
and these words of Paul. They seek to melt, to grumble, to have it surrender to the presence of Christ alive and at work in me so that it might shape how I speak, how I relate, how I live life. And more and more, would we press into praise and rejoicing as we share stories of the goodness of God in our lives over the obstacles that create grumbling? With this mind of Christ, who, who never once grumbled, be at work in us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.